quicker. So I'll start out just by introducing myself. My name is Tom Smith. I'm CEO of Gato Images, a DMLA member. And today we're talking about um, AI you can use today. And I think, um, you know, this is meant to be a couple of things. It's meant to be something to build on the presentations and what we started to do at the annual meeting in October. Uh, we did a panel about practical AI, AI that can be applied to make your backend workflow more efficient, um, to do things like automatic tagging, automatic captioning, and processing of images. Um, we, before, we talked more about customer-facing visual search and that kind of thing. So now we're really turning our focus to how can AI make your internal processes more efficient. Um, and so today we want to build on what we started. We want to open that conversation up to members who weren't able to make it to the annual meeting. And we also want to just be able to open the floor to people who have specific questions for our panelists today. Uh, so we really want to encourage an ongoing discussion. And um, we're slated for an hour here, but we'll stick around to the presenters. I believe will be able to stick around as well for as long as people have questions that they'd like to ask. So we're gonna dive in and start to talk about AI you can use today. And um, we have uh, four presenters here today. Um, I'll be moderating. And I'm um, just gonna start off by uh, introducing Georgie from, um, from Amaga. Uh, and this is uh, you know, a company that we, we brought in for our panel. They do a lot of really wonderful work in automatic tagging and custom modeling. And I'm just going to hand over the floor if I'm able to here. We'll try to do um, a screen share so you can see the presentation here. If not, we've just asked each of our panelists to uh, talk a little bit about their company. So I'll hand this over now to you and to talk about uh, and introduce Amaga. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, can you please confirm that you hear me well? Um, because uh, I do a lot of Zooming these days, and sometimes it seems that there are problems. Can you uh, hear yes, me? I can hear, hear you. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. So I think you should stop sharing, so I can stop. Sh uh, I can start sharing because currently I have a problem with that. Okay. So. Gotcha. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining. I'll be presenting just from this PDF to to make sure there are no compatibility issues and so on. Um, so I'll try to keep it short in the matter of five to maybe six, seven minutes. Um, this is the presentation that I will use from the actual conference uh, that uh, participate in a panel along with some other great panelists. Some of them are also joining us today. So um, at Imaga, we've, we've always been trying to make AI practical. Uh, we've never tried to mystify AI and, and make it look like something that's super, super superficial, uh, to say so. Um, and, um, you know, with, related to that, uh, we've been doing different types of technologies from uh, tagging content to facial recognition to visual search. Back in the end of 2014, we released our first self-service API. Then 2015 unofficially and 2017 officially, we released an on-premise version of it. Uh, we've been servicing um, a lot of different customers across the world and currently serve more than 24,000 developers. We had a good growth since last October, uh, practically in every place around the, around the world for various is different use cases. Um, we've most interestingly, we've trained uh, one of the biggest image classifiers in the world that can recognize more than 300,000 different plant species, plant snap, uh, and analyze billion of images for various purposes. Uh, we've been competing um, with the top uh, cloud, typical cloud solution providers, I think in a very good rivalry fashion uh, where we try to improve uh, each other products further. And um, due to various independent evaluations, our out-of-the-box technology is one of the top one to top three most precise on, on various types of text, uh, tests. So especially in the context of um, media licensing and image licensing, what we have identified as a major problems with manual annotation, um, that it's too delayed in time and too expensive. Typically the workflow of a content creator or a visual content creator is so much more biased towards spending time rewarding, annotating, and organizing photos 
uh, which eats a lot of resources. Uh, and uh, this is something that, that we aim to help or, and actually have helped in many different occasions uh, to be improved. Um, it's um, <clears throat> exhausting to a huge extent if you need to do that, especially if the content is diverse. And sometimes you may oversee and um, create even some erroneous or mistaken keywords and, and ruin overall search experience for, for the licensed media collections. Uh, people related to that are sometimes subjective and they overlook things easier than AI. Uh, I mean, we include it. And so that's why we, we regularly keep check on, <clears throat> even when we do manual annotation of things for the purpose of machine learning, then we see during validation how different things have been uh, manually uh, erroneous or we've, we've made mistakes while training the technology, even being experts into that, just but because of human um, exhaustion to say so. Uh, a few more things, um, it's, it's hard to, to train people, uh, especially with changing requirements. Uh, and if it's a huge team of people, how these criteria change and everything else related to dynamics of, uh, let's say, industry trends or something else, what needs to be annotated, what doesn't, what makes the most importance and impact. Uh, last but not least, especially with the boom of user-generated content in various scenarios, uh, you know, we, we were we are quite some time in this space. And I remember like four or five years ago when we were pitching Kimago, we were stating um, in the whole previous history of photography, like analog photography, more than more than a hundred years are taken less images in total than in the previous uh, year in terms of digital content. And, uh, you know, it was funny for me when I recalled that because our latest research shows that in the last two years has been taken more digital content than in the whole previous history of digital content creation. So in the last, let's say, 15 years. So you can think of it like it's an exponential growth of digital content, but at the same time, the number of people that can do things manually is not growing. I mean, world and world population and employees, they're not growing exponentially. Um, and, and their skills, that, the skills that they need to acquire also. So um, it's a huge discrepancy between how much content is generated worldwide and how much um, people can handle the task of annotating it. And it become like a, images in a shoebox that nobody can see and do something with. So uh, how we've, we've approached this, and we've been approaching this for several years already, our out-of-the-box solution is for automated tagging. So basically analyzing fully automatically the image, um, <clears throat> relying on a huge data set of images uh, and annotated scenes and objects to suggest various keywords that describe it in an automated way uh, with certain level of confidence for each of the different conceptual or particular object-related keywords. Uh, which of course aims to to replace to a huge extent the need of human annotation. The good thing with that is that <clears throat> let's say we have a hybrid process where people confirm or deny several attacks, then this lear learns and over time gets better and better in terms of um, understanding and complying to certain explicit or implicit standards of tagging. Another interesting uh, sub aspect of tagging, let's call it, is the positional annotation of objects. So we cannot just, we, we don't just suggest keywords, but also can um, physically locate where the object is within the raster. We can recognize faces, uh, which can be useful in various cases. Let's not talk that much about security and privacy in this case, but in the media licensing space, let's say you have uh, people uh, and you want to make sure that each photo that has a person face uh, has model release associated with that or if you detect it's the same person you can eventually reuse some of the model releases um, that you have originally if the type of model release of course allows um, some longer time period so it's not a one-time one. -time one. Uh, another interesting aspect content moderation especially if we talk about user generated content how can you um, identify uh, con content that can be harmful in a way, offensive, suggestive, and, and so on, uh, which makes it, mm, to, to put it other way, uh, it's very 
um, it's a huge implicit uh, burden and impediment to the boom of user generated content licensing that you're not sure what's the quality of the content. I'm not talking only from the aesthetics point of view, but also from the safety point of view. You cannot just upload something and not let it be reviewed or moderated in a certain way, which is a very timely job and it, um, it limits the growth of user generated content licensing because of this lack of safety. So this is also something that we try to automate or at least reduce the scale of uh, manual work required for that. Uh, we also have color extraction. It's not a big deal, but it, it's very useful in certain cases when you want to match polyets of images and so on. Just as a comparison, and I'm almost finished, um, I have more slides, but they're not that much important and I'll leave some of them maybe for the Q&A session afterwards. Um, so if we need to, to compare uh, the manual annotation of one million photos costs more than 90,000 US dollars if we calculate the human workforce required for that. In comparison, uh, if only a small fraction of it needs to be uh, moderated manually and everything else is uh, autom automatically filtered or annotated. This is a total of uh, 300, let's say 20, 30, or even, I don't know, even 400, uh, 4,000, sorry, dollars are much less compared to the previous amount of price. Um, last but not least, uh, visual search is a unique capability where technology will, will be, you know, by definition better by human beings because you just cannot keep an index of millions or tens of millions of images in your head and find them fast. And this is something where inherently the technology is much better than people just because it can extract various types of visual features, either global or local ones, and allow a comparison and search just based on a visual reference uh, where you can find something that you're looking for and find all the images um, in a certain set or collection that resemble in some way semantically and or visually uh, the given image. So in long story short, uh, um, that's part of the mission that we have as a company and we want to see you apply more and more AI. We want to help you in this process. You know, we don't want to just make some money actually stock photography, image licensing, these type of fields, they are not the most lucrative financially for us just because the volumes of images, they are not as much as in some other kind of social media or user generated content related services. But still um, even, how to say this, emotionally, actually stock photography was the very first field where we started to experiment with automated tagging. So we have some kind of emotional collection uh, and connection with this field. And we believe that if more and more people use this, uh, this is getting better and better. So it's like a positive uh, reinforcement uh, loop or cycle. And we, as, as I said, we believe that this may also unlock a lot of unused opportunity and potential in the user generated content space. That's on my side. Uh, I don't want to take more time um, because uh, I'm already, you know, hitting the 10 minute mark and I, I used to try to make it just five to seven minutes. So I'll be happy to answer, I believe afterwards, after the other panelists, uh, some of your questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, we heard about a lot of different uh, technologies here that are relevant to the industry, auto tagging, content moderation, um, and, you know, even things in the creative side, like uh, determining the dominant colors in an image can be really valuable. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Brad Falcons from CloudSight. CloudSight is uh, doing something a little bit different from uh, anyone else in the field, I think. They're actually using AI to write full length descriptions of images. So trying to include the context in an image and not just the tags. And obviously these two capabilities work together. You need uh, structured tagging, you need um, things like identifying colors, but you can also, in many cases in our industry, you need to have an actual description written and CloudSight has some, some pretty interesting tech to share there. So I'll turn it over to Brad. Yeah, thanks, Tom, appreciate it. Um, and Georgie did a really great job of covering the market and uh, why stock photography needs this sort of technology um, where AI is understanding and you know helping get, uh, alleviate a little bit of the expense of human labor, labor when uh, a machine can do you know sometimes a better job than the humans can. And there's certain levels of that, of course, 
Um, and so one of the things that, that you know, CloudSight was really interested with um, at the beginning is this, this idea of understanding, of visual cognition and understanding. If we take a look at the AI space in, in total, um, one of the final missing pieces of the pie for um, AI achieving a sort of idea of general understanding is this idea of sight uh, or vision. Um, you know, for a long time, speech was sort of one of those pieces. And so, you know, we would speak into these, these IVRs where we would talk and you'd say like, do you recognize speech? And the computer would understand it as, did you recognize beach? Um, and so voice recognition was one of those things that required constant correction. It didn't really arrive fast enough, a lot of frustration. And then Siri arrived. And it was a perfect demonstration. Uh, the first example that we saw that it wasn't about recognition, but cognition and understanding the content and the context of what we were saying instead of just each individual word. Um, and so one of the things that we do a little bit differently, uh, and of course there's, uh, there's a lot of need for a lot of different types of image recognition. There's a lot of different types of application for image recognition. Um, but one of the things that CloudSight does a little bit differently is instead of looking at a particular catalog of classes uh, or categories of an image, we'll describe the image in natural language, allowing you to you know, put that into Elasticsearch or some type of semantic search, um, or even just use those captions online where you're able to attract traffic to your website if you have an exposed catalog and drive traffic to the website. So we've seen a couple of those different cases in, in stock photo. Um, and of course, between the search and retrieval, you know, it really kind of covers a lot of the cases um, that the inventory is being handled. Um, and so one of the things that also uh, I'd like to think that makes CloudSight a lot different is that we, you know, we took a look at the traditional computer vision model and we said, okay, well, you know, computer vision model, you know, it gets built, it gets trained, it gets exposed. And we said, well, okay, instead of accepting failure, you know, image gets sent to the, uh, to the neural network and maybe you get a response that you don't like, instead of accepting that, um, what if a system could learn through failure? What if it could continuously learn online? And so um, it's kind of interesting. We started working on this in late 2012 and, and several years later, um, this sort of human hybrid intelligence where humans were in the loop in real time started getting a name and it was called hybrid intelligence. The first time that that term was coined was actually at the NIPS conference in 2016. Um, and so one of the ways that this looks like is, you know, we'll get an image in and we'll send it off to the AI. And if the AI can understand to a certain degree of confidence what that thing is, um, then we'll send it off to, uh, to, you know, the user, to the customer. Um, but if the AI is a bit confused, or if we think that, you know, there's a bit more improvement, a bit more detail that we can add to that response, uh, then we'll send it off to humans that usually within about eight to 12, sometimes 15 seconds, uh, we'll be able to fix that response and then send that out to the user. We'll simultaneously creating additional training data in order to help the system improve. And so to date, CloudSight's recognized over 1.3 billion images. And these are images that are not only recognized and processed, but also learned from. Um, and so just to kind of illustrate this really quick, uh, what this looks like in practice, I'm gonna show a little bit of a demonstration um, with some images that you know I typically see uh, in terms of stock photography. So this first one here, this is just a simple drag and drop demo on our website. This first one here is, a, is an image that we got off a, a microstock website. And it says, uh, CloudSight responds with man in orange jacket and black pants standing on pedestrian lane during daytime. And so one of the things that's very interesting about how CloudSight puts this together is that, you know, much like humans, we have a vocabulary of words that are maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 words. And we mix and match those words together in order to describe what we see and explain that to, you know, maybe another human or, or you know, maybe our pets. Um, but the point is that we're able to accurately dis explain an infinite domain of things by mixing and matching words together, which, which kind of frees us from those bounded domains of, of, um, of the past. And so when I go and I take a look at, even, even when we take a look at images that are, you know, maybe really contrasty and it's hard to understand exactly what's going on, this type of methodology is very robust. Um, so here, you know, it's a little bit difficult to understand what's going on in this image, but it's just enough discernible detail. We can kind of start to see, you know, it's nighttime, you know, there's a little bit of stars, we're seeing a silhouette, maybe some blue hue in the sky. Um, and this kind of looks like a tent. And so it says, green tent under blue sky during nighttime. 
Um, and so, you know, if we, there's another picture here that I thought was pretty fascinating. Even tiny little details in the image um, we're able to discern. So it says, this is a white and black house on green grass field near mountain during daytime. Um, and of course, you know, if we look at the picture, that pretty much describes what's going on. And so what this essentially can do is you can take these descriptions uh, and you can put them into whatever existing text-based search that you have and allow your users to be able to find things very easily in your catalog. Um, and again, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, in some cases where that catalog is exposed, um, you can then take these descriptions and publish them online and increase the traffic to your website by allowing the natural SEO process to take place in organic search, um, which of course then, you know, hopefully drives up revenue and all those other great things that we look for. Um, so yeah, so I just a quick intro and, and explanation of, of uh, what we do. And I'm, you know, of course, happy, uh, as we mentioned earlier, to uh, answer a few more questions about the tech and, and what, what kind of things it can do for your company. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I'm just going to jump in very briefly here. Um, and I just want to make sure, you know, that we're showing not only what capabilities uh, these companies have, but also I want to show a little bit about how it can actually be applied directly in our industry. So I'm going to share very briefly what we're doing at Gato Images with both of the technologies that you've just seen. Um, so you can see an actual use case here in our industry. Um, so, you know, one thing, uh, let me see if I can go ahead here, uh, looking at applying Amaga's tech. For us, we use the uh, auto tagging capability that Georgie described. Um, and you know, what does that look like? So here's an example, we cover a lot of tech products. This is a, a webcam and a remote security camera from a company called Wise. So one of our photographers might shoot this in the studio, send this photo into our system. And uh, we start out by running it through technologies, including Imago's auto tagging. And you can see the keywords that we get out of this are things like product, webcam, technology, camera. Um, you know, we can be more or less selective about which uh, keywords we take. We tend to be very selective. Um, so we only select keywords where I believe we have over 95% probability that they're accurate. Um, you can again set that to a threshold differently depending on your own needs, but that's where we set ours. So we get sort of a background level of keywords here that are helpful in describing this image. Um, when we actually put this through to one of our marketplaces, in this case, it's Getty Images who we work with, they're first reviewed by our human team. So we never rely on AI exclusively, but it does provide sort of the raw materials that our human captioners will go in and look at. So webcam and technology were both things that they felt would be appropriate and those get passed through um, and using the controlled vocabs of our specific marketplaces, those then become searchable terms. And then that leads to discovery and use of the image. So here, that image ended up appearing in the New York Times in an article about a data breach at WISE. Um, so for us, it's a, a capability where for a fairly low cost, we can add in the sort of keyword suggestion and pull out terms that are important but might not be captured in a normal caption writing. Uh, you know, we might not say webcam, for example, even though this can be used as a webcam. Um, maybe we wouldn't put in product in the description, but because it's uh, pulled out by Amago's auto tagging and then our captioners highlight that as an accurate keyword, we're able to put it in and increase uh, searchability on marketplaces and then ultimately drive sales to the end customer in this case. So that's a, a, an example of how that technology can be applied. Um, moving on to, to CloudSight and how we've been using their tech, you know, Brad described that this is something you can use to better understand your own catalog in addition to, in some cases, actually exposing these captions for users or for search engines to see. And that's exactly how we're using it. So the, uh, the resolution is a little bit low here. So sorry for that, but um, just to show, this is a photo from a completely uh, unannotated archive from a photographer who was shooting in San Francisco in the 1980s and 1990s. And we acquired rights to, uh, to represent this collection, but our challenge was how do we pull out content that might need more human research and how do we distinguish, you know, just sort of random street scenes and things from photos that might have important people in them and might need more um, you know, human research time. So what we've started to do is run uh, all of the photos from collections like these through CloudSite system. Um, and what we get out of it is uh, you know, really usable text. So this is an example of when we ran photos through a process using low cost human captioners. 
we got things like you see highlighted here, a couple of men standing next to a man in a suit and tie. You know, you get a, a sort of a, a certain amount of, uh, of detail here, but we probably paid about 30, 30 to 50 cents for that caption to be written. Uh, certainly not good enough to put out in the marketplace, and really it's not even that great in terms of a, a finding aid to do better research on the collection. Um, looking at what we got from CloudSite, though, three men wearing suits and posing for a photograph. Uh, again, you know, this is something where we'd still want to go in and do more research on it. Um, but still, we're getting much more useful information. So just the fact that there's three people here, uh, you know, that drives research where we can try to, to match up um, who those people are or what the context is. Um, wearing suits, so we can do keyword searches across our, our collections for something like that. And that might clue us in that these, are, these could be politicians or these could be visiting people that we would want to do more research into. Um, and then also just the fact that it's a, a posed photograph is something that we'd uh, you know, want to pull out as being worthy of perhaps more research. This photographer did a lot of sort of street scenes, so just to know that this is more probably of a, of a formal uh, shoot, that would be something that would clue us in. So now that we have this description that was written basically almost for free, I mean, the cost at scale is very low, um, we end up with, uh, with a finding aid that we can then use to search for photos that we want to then hand off to our human researchers who can start to add in more details. So and now you see our research team starting to augment this. Uh, they've researched where it was taken. Um, they've added a little bit more detail. And then ultimately they would uh, go in and, uh, and research and actually start to link up these faces to specific people. So again, um, auto tagging, a great capability for um, highlighting things that our team can then hand over to marketplaces and that can lead to more searchability and better sales. And on um, the, the cloud site side, we're using that to write descriptions that can then guide our human research team to the materials in an otherwise undocumented historical collection so that they can know which photos are worth more research and which photos are worth putting their much more expensive time into uh, so we can really optimize processing a collection that could be hundreds, thousands, or in some cases, even millions of images strong. So that's a little bit of a look of how those technologies apply in the industry. I'm going to take uh, myself off of screen share here, and I'd like to hand it over to Jonathan uh, Wells from SIPA. Um, he's going to introduce uh, another company that they've been working with, talk a little bit more about AI applied to uh, his space. Uh, thanks, Tom. So I I'm actually not going to have a presentation. I'm going to leave that to our friends over at Chooch, which is a San Francisco-based uh, AI company that we've been working with uh, for a while now. And um, Maybe I'll, I'll I'll jump in after they make their presentation and see how and, and explain a little bit about how SIPA has been um, using their their services. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our friends at Chooch. Let's see, do we have anybody present there? Uh, okay, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe there's some, some technical difficulties here. Jonathan, uh, if you yeah, heard anything. Yeah, we're supposed to have Jeff or Emra. Hi there. It is there we go. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Oh, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let, let, me, uh, let me share my screen. And um, here we go. Okay. You. Slideshow. So um, I'm Jeffrey Goldsmith from Chooch. I'm the head of marketing and Chooch is visual AI as a service and we're at chooch.ai. Um, so we offer a broad range of uh, visual AI services um, and for um, uh, sort of the media industry, we um, essentially um, answer the question of, you know, who is this? You know, what happened here? And you know what, what what's happening in this scene? We can we can both tag actions and faces and objects, a whole host of different models. We we have over a hundred different models that we apply uh, in various scenarios. Um, our training process is is quite simple and um, and very robust. Um, you know we train with uh, different models for each kind of visual data. And we offer end-to-end -end services. We, we train for specific use cases 
So if, uh, if a client wants to go deep with, for example, celebrity images, as Jonathan's company does, we train for that so that um, uh, they can recognize um, movie stars from Iceland without human in intervention. Um, so, and our patented machine learning system creates what we call perception libraries from visual data, which include faces and uh, objects and so forth and so on. I'll explain a little bit more about perceptions in, in a moment. Um, we apply layered models that work uh, together to classify objects. And um, uh, we basically recognize context and that allows our system to work very quickly. Because once you understand context, then you understand what those objects are likely to be within those contexts. Um, that, that's sort of how the human mind works. And so uh, we've taken that learning and applied it to AI. Um, so what that training generates is fast, accurate metadata. And all of our services are in the cloud, although for, for these use cases, although we also offer edge services in other areas, for example, for uh, security or for um, uh, tracking actions um, uh, very quickly in, uh, in certain use cases where speed is, is absolutely uh, critical. Um, our perception libraries far exceed current AI standards. It's very fast and you can demo that today um, with your iPhone. Um, once, uh, once we've done the training, uh, as I said, Chooch identifies objects contextually. For example, is this a food situation or is it a fashion situation? And once the AI knows that, then it, it searches its library in that area, thereby um, resulting in um, very fast response times, as you'll see. Um, the API uh, streams uh, images or videos to our server, and then we return um, metadata. It integrates uh, into any service uh, quite easily. Um, and we you know, provide consulting services to help that happen. Um, one of our clients, for example, um, is presently uh, integrating um, into a, a large um, reseller of vehicles and we're doing, uh, we're, we're checking the quality of images for that retailer. Um, are the images blurry? Are the images at the right angle? Is there any dust in the image? Is there any dirt or, or, or things left over that shouldn't be in the scene? We can check all this really easily and they're integrating the API. Once we've built their library, their perception library, we integrate the API and then all the contributed content gets, to, gets checked against that individual perception library built for that customer. And the benefit of this is these very granular perceptions that um, uh, are available to our customers. We have 200,000 public classes and those you can demo right now. If you go to chooch.ai slash demo, you can download an app onto your Android or, um, or uh, iPhone and, um, and then demo you know, what, what we've got built. Um, here's the use case that we built for Jonathan Wells at SIPA, uh, essentially identifying who this is, what she's wearing, the style, the face. And as a previous presenter um, explained, this is, a, there's a huge cost savings in doing this sort of thing, right? It takes a human, you know, a minute or whatever to, to tag this. But if it's an obscure star from Iceland or South Africa or somewhere in the world, you might not even know who that celebrity is in the photo. But by training Chooch, we can tag. Um, we also do this for e-commerce. So, you know, one of our customers uh, is a, um, they, they are basically are an e-commerce assistant. So people who are selling stuff on eBay. They upload an image and we tag it for that person. They can select what tags are appropriate, but we, we're sort of a, you know, a, a tag assistant. And this increases sales on um, platforms like eBay because the images then become more findable, right? So th this is a, the benefit of, of these kind of tagging services, you know, one in, one in um, for media or one for e-commerce. 
Um, content delivery. Um, we've got a video of this if you want to see it, but you know, we, we, we trained in, uh, for artwork and essentially you can go into a museum, you can uh, look at artwork with your phone, and then when you get a hit, you can click on that and receive more content. The same works at, the, at zoos, right? What is this giraffe doing? This giraffe is eating. <laughs> and obviously that's true, but there's more interesting content like acacia, mimosa, you know, how much food do they eat? This kind of content we can provide through tagging and, 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 and provisioning of content. Um, let's go to the next one. So any kind of video, we can track actions, right? So this is a combination of object recognition and action detection. Did the uh, baseball bit player hit the ball? What number player is that? We can tag all this and feed this into any kind of database or, or live feed uh, uh, accompanying video. And the same could happen in an operating room, in a kitchen, and so forth and so on. So this is a combination, this is why I describe this combination of models that allows great flexibility for Chooch. And we custom build these for, for, uh, for customers. Um, here's another great example for um, uh, provisioning of uh, media space, right, for, um, for content providers. So we can tag what's in images, and then you can serve sort of ads into this space. Um, I realize this presentation might be a little different than others. It's very use case oriented. So you get examples of, of, of the end result of our, of our, of our work. Um, augmented vision. We're um, well along in, in uh, producing an augmented vision um, application. And um, we, uh, you know, there's a bit of media out there uh, on this about what we're doing here, um, but it, it's still not public but this is, this is coming. And um, I'm sure all the other um, presenters in this space are interested in augmented vision as well. This allows you to use um, AR glasses to essentially tag um, objects or people in real time. And the applications are, are huge for this, right? Uh, from um, you know, folks that are repairing things to um, uh, security guards to um, uh, you know, you could use this for night vision and so forth and so on. Um, so there you go. That's Chooch in a nutshell. And again, our demo is available at chooch.ai.demo. Love to hear from Jonathan uh, about this. Um, if, if you have more comments on, on what we've done with you specifically. Thanks so much. Sure. So I'll just uh, add a little bit to, uh, to Jeff's presentation. So we started using uh, Chooch AI uh, for tagging, and in particular in uh, in our coverage uh, our coverage for uh, fashion fashion shows and fashion weeks, which uh, for us is uh, very heavy in terms of the volume of content we're producing, um, and that's coupled with the speed at which we need to get the um, the content out, um, and three of the four main uh, fashion weeks are in Europe and a lot of our businesses in Europe. So we're sort of behind the, the eight ball a little bit in terms of the, uh, the time to get the content back over to Europe and available to our customers. And a lot of, uh, one of our challenges was that a lot of our uh, usage and uh, a lot of our revenue is generated by content, which is pushed out to, our, our direct customers or through partnerships around the world. Uh, we are working with uh, some partners more and more on an API. So what we update in our database get, gets updated uh, on their side. But we do still push out a huge volume of content uh, via, via FTP, both to, as I said, to both to uh, partners and clients. And so um, we simply do not, as many of the presenters said, we simply do not have the time or the resource. We don't have the resources and we don't have the time. Even if we have the resource, I'm not sure we have the time to uh, add those tags to those images. And what makes the image uh, a lot more sellable, a lot more valuable, both in the immediate term and long term, is just those added keywords, those added tags, uh, like color, like patterns, uh, things like that, that we simply just don't have the time to put on it. So. 
Whereas before we would just have sort of, as Tom mentioned, maybe a, a general caption, uh, who, what, where, when. Um, Chooch allowed us to add in those uh, additional uh, tags like patterns, like leopard print, like gold, like silver, um, which we simply couldn't do. And so when fashion on the editorial side, when uh, customers are creating their content, maybe it's based around the current trend of, of leopard patterns or a particular color, uh, we now can, our, our images are now in the mix for those, uh, for that content. Um, also, as Tom mentioned, which was very important to us is that while we have a pretty good team of people who can, who can uh, manually tag images and particularly people, because that's a lot of what we do, there are many, many people, obviously, that we don't know uh, right away. And um, what we'll do is like on a big uh, award show, for example, we will train Chooch, we'll uh, feed Chooch with, uh, for example, all of the nominees uh, from, for example, from the Oscars. And not just the main uh, actors and actresses, but the uh, short films, the animated films, the uh, director of photography, uh, the foreign films. People we just don't know uh, right away. And we'll train Chooch for that. And then um, we're able to run the photos through Chooch and get those tags. Now Chooch isn't, didn't, uh, wasn't 100%, but it got pretty close. And our uh, sort of, if, if of the, you know, if normally we, we couldn't tag maybe 20% of the photos, we just simply didn't have the time to, to do the research to find the person, uh, maybe we're only left with 5%. And that's a big difference. And, uh, you know, obviously those, uh, those people are, are very important in those markets and now we can deliver that content. So it's really been for us, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're a small company um, and uh, Chooch has allowed us to sort of compete against companies with a lot more resources, uh, both uh, in the quality of the tags and certainly in the speed. Um, and, and as, as everyone said, you know, we, we have to sort of still, uh, because we're, we work in the editorial field, uh, we have to be very, very careful about what we're putting out there. So we do have to do like, uh, you know, a manual, um, QC before we push the content out. Uh, we don't want to, um, uh, misidentify something or someone. Uh, so that's very, still very important. Um, but it's really enabled us to do things that, you know, we simply just, just don't have the resources or again, the time to do. So um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I just want to quickly uh, put in here that um, all of the demos that people have mentioned uh, are now on our Twitter feed. We have links to those. Uh, it's at DMLA underscore org. Um, so if anyone wants to try it out, the demo is available from any of the companies. You can go on and do that uh, from our Twitter feed. So now I just want to open the floor up to questions from the audience. Um, if you do want to ask a question, I just ask that you unmute yourself and, and, uh, and take the floor um, and then mute yourself again when you're done speaking. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, I had a question. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can can you uh, can you hear us? Here, go. You can go ahead and uh, and ask. Uh, Okay, let's see. I think we have another question coming in here. It looks like um, Vladimir raised his hand. Yes, hello. Uh, yes, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, other, other, sorry, yeah, on you go. Yeah, uh, my question is uh, about uh, uh, identifying the technical problems on photos. Uh, uh, with uh, AI, what, what, what is, is there any approach here? Technical, I mean, artifacts, blurs, uh, uh, problems with light. Uh, 
so I assume you're asking the presenters if there's any way to sort of do a, qual a quality control, but from a, a technical perspective, is that right? Exactly, exactly. I, I think uh, 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 Jeff from Chooch, uh, Jeff, you spoke about that with the uh, auto reseller. Maybe you can elaborate you. on that a little bit. Yeah, so it, essentially uh, we train to, sorry, you, you might call it anomaly detection, right? So you, you train Chooch for uh, what the images should look like, right? Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the, um, a hotel, a, a, a well-made bed should look like this, should look like X. And you train Chooch with a number of images of, of what a well-made bed looks like in a hotel room. And then yeah. when the bed gets made, if a pillow is askew, we can detect that through anomaly detection because there isn't, a, you know, it, it, we detect that there's a difference between what the, what the baseline is and what the bed should look like. Does that answer the question? Uh, obviously, I, I meant more uh, technical problems with photo. I mean, uh, the, the, oh, the uh, ma many light or, or low light or maybe some artifacts on lens, some, something like that. Absolutely. We, we do artifact detection and blurriness detection, um, wrong angles. Um, bad cropping, we can show like what an object should look like, the composition we can set as a kind of baseline, train the system for composition. And then when a, a badly composed uh, image, for example, a tangent, a tangent is when an object is touching the edge of the frame, we can mm -hmm. detect tangents so that you never have like someone's head touching the top of a picture, for example, that's sort of an unwanted um, compositional problem, we could detect tangents. So, and blurriness is quite easy for us to do. So, yes, absolutely. We could, we could demo that for you if you... Um, it's about Chooch, right? Your product. Chooch. C-H-O-O-C-H. Great, great. I'll check it out. Maybe contact you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. And I just want to hand it over. Sarah, did you have a question there? Yeah, so I had a question. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Yes, now we can hear yeah, you. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I think it's because I have my headphones in. Um, so my question was to CloudSight. So we currently get caption data. Um, so I was wondering if you can do a mix of what's going on in the image, but also do text analysis as well. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so we do actually provide some text analysis through the API currently um, in, in that JSON object, that data that we send back um, to the user. Um, but there's some additional things that we've done for other customers in terms of custom development that we'd be happy to take a look at with you depending upon um, what type of requirements that you're looking for, what type of problems that you're trying to solve internally. Okay, great. Um, are you going to share your email at the end of this so I can contact you directly? Yeah, definitely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that in the chat so you have a copy of it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank and Tom, you. speaking of the, of the chat, we've got a couple of conversations going, um, which I think might be helpful to share with the group. Uh, one question from Savannah was, does CloudSight have any integrated location GPS ability to pull from IPTC to add specific location data to captions? And I think Brad answered that. I don't know if you want to give the answer to the group or how you want to handle what's going on in the chat. Thanks, yeah, definitely. So we actually, as part of the API, there are, um, uh, we, we give the ability for the user to provide location-based data through the API. Um, it's not something we actively pull out of the IPTC information, simply because there's some images that, you know, either the user doesn't want that shared with us. Um, so we've had to kind of be careful what we do in, in terms of GDPR. Um, but if the developer, op developer opts into sending that to us through the API, then it gives the system a hint uh, in, in terms of, you know, what that location might be. So the, this, the system will use that to determine, you know, okay, well, if I see enough background information and context, it just kind of adds to that context uh, for the image. I have a follow-up. Is the photographer or the creator 
able to give you permission to pull that data? Is that if we were working and we had permission to be able to pull that data, could we do it? We could, yeah. I mean, this is this is one of those cases where um, if it's something that is needed, we'd be happy to add that on. Reading the IPTC data is actually a relatively simple process for us, so we can we can do that if that was a need that uh, you were looking to fill. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. So one other question, and um, this is one that, that came in even before the presentations. Um, how do these work with video? So I wonder if uh, is anybody uh, doing work with video, or is it only stills at the moment? And uh, if you're if you're not doing it, what's the state of the field right now in terms of applying these same kinds of technologies to footage? Um, and I think that will be particularly important to our, our, our new colleagues from Axel who have just uh, merged with with DMLA. Yeah, definitely. I, I guess I'll start with this because I uh, just kind of carrying over from the last last question. So um, we have done work with video. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that every client likes to process video slightly differently. So we haven't built out a standard API for that yet, but um, we've done it in two different ways, in particular in terms of modality. One of the ways we've done it is by looking at the individual frames of the video uh, and then coming up with sort of a synopsis or a summary in terms of a per shot summary or per scene summary or sometimes a per video summary. Um, so that could be describing the kind of general content you might see in a video uh, throughout the entire video itself or on a per scene or a per shot summary based on how that scene is decided to be split up. Um, the other way that we've done this too is uh, based on action understanding in the video. So we look at how those frames are going through the, you know, through time and space and we're able to understand the types of um, actions that are going on inside of that video. So, you know, just sim similar to how we like to explain what's going on in, in still images in terms of the whole scene understanding, um, we can also focus on individual primary subjects of the image, or we can focus on um, the story of what's going on inside of the image. Um, and so, you know, there's certain cases where it really kind of helps to understand, you know, oh, okay, this is a cat jumping off the couch. Um, or this is, you know, a person feeding somebody else. And, you know, so the story, um, when the story is necessary to be understood, then that's something that we, we generally start looking at in terms of more of a, a custom um, engagement with, uh, with a customer. I, I just, this is Jeff from Chooch. We process video too. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's super interesting. Um, augmented vision, that's video. Um, our app will demo that if you download it from from the app store. It's, um, it's fascinating to, to see how this evolves. Anyway, I just don't want to go into too long because I know we're at time. Yeah. In, in Sorry, the I have, a, I have uh, a question if I can quickly ask. Um, what, what's your success rate from uh, partners such as like Getty or Adobe based on the, the captions with Clyde site? Have, have you had a lot of um, customers submit to those other libraries and uh, and if so what was their feedback success in in what terms do you mean i'm not sure i i clearly got the question well to, to be honest we've used absolutely everything we've used uh, google vision we've used microsoft cognitive services and it's never been um in depth enough or granular enough to be um deemed as a you know useful for a keyword search i just want to know if you have any experience with submitting to other libraries like what the feedback's been like um you know the success of those images on different search sites that'd be really interesting to know yeah um i'd gladly comment on that because that's one of my favorite topics um you know it's if you test out of the box solutions i don't know if you've test ours as well um it's, I would say, think of it like a kid that has a lot of common knowledge and sense, but it's never deep enough and not specialized in a specific domain area. So it's, um, it's like a toddler kind of tagging that, that the out of the box solution has. Um, they, they don't go into too much detail. They don't co to comply to a specific set of rules or vocab just because they're generic. Um, so they are kind of good initial indication of what can be done. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of people are put off uh, like you, if I got it correctly, because it's not specific enough for what you need. But 
you know, that's perfectly understandable for you as a perception from the customer point of view. From the vendor point of view, the only sensible way this to be addressed is actually by some kind of specialization or customization of the solution, which doesn't mean necessarily a business model for customization but, but service. Are, so are you trying to say that you have a model specific to stock photography tagging? Uh, we have, but unfortunately, those who have been trained with specific customers' data, so they're not made public just because someone wants to use them as a kind of a competitive advantage in their processes. Uh, but the good thing is that actually everybody, if they already have the data set that's manually annotated, which most likely is the case because you don't have or you haven't used um, a technology to annotate your data set, so you already have a pretty good uh, training set by what your daily operations have been collecting in the last months or years or more. Uh, so if an agency is willing to share their data set, uh, machine learning algorithms, no matter if this is us or some of our colleagues, um, if they're open to such models, of course, uh, I mean, to a model of collaboration where they train custom models, uh, technology can, can be really performant. And uh, so it's in a way, um, how to say, help us to help you kind of a scheme where if you open your database for us, of course, under some kind of exclusivity, if you want, uh, if you don't want to contribute to the general audience, uh, then the technology can be made to work very well for you. Um, I'll, we have more than 220 customers in various verticals. More than 50 of them use some kind of customization. I can recall just two cases where somebody has tried to train something specific for their purpose and was, was not super happy and excited with the end results. Um, as a reference, I mentioned this, we've trained even classifiers with super fi fine grain details, differences like uh, plants uh, that look alike a lot to each other and still it can achieve a very high level of precision. So it's a machine learning, as I said, um, I like to demystify it and it's not, it's not magic. It's uh, a good quality of data, a good structure of data, uh, then uh, a good sample set, and the, the the only magic, let's say, is the optimization of the machine learning models. Um, that's why machine learning specialists are quite expensive, because it's not a trivial skill. Uh, but if you can provide a data set, then I think we or some of our competitors, maybe, uh, they we can train a pretty good model. So I'm, I'm happy to explore this with you, if you'd like. Um, uh, even like- Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's something that I would be interested in exploring. Um, I, I, to be honest, um, it's only really since working with the DMLA that it's become more apparent there needs to be a, a hybrid model of AI and, and humans. So I'd be interested to know um, if anyone else, in the, anyone else in the call would like to share who they've been using for a manual annotation at the moment, um, at, at, just to build up that data set to make something that's much more scalable. Yeah, maybe DMOA can start an initiative where we build some kind of a data set from existing databases, of course, without violating the, um, the rights management of, of the different authors, but maybe small thumbnails or watermarked images, even they can be ignored. I mean, the watermarks to a huge extent. So um, just like a side note to the organizers, but if, if we can build a good stock database, uh, maybe this is... Um, this is a very good starting point. I mean, for all the vendors to have some good uh, solutions for stock um, and this kind of images. And I just want to jump I, I, in I there um, with a, with a quick, uh, sorry. Um, I just want to jump in there with a quick question because um, I, I see from Paul here at Getty Images, a question I think ties in very closely to, to, to that question of training data. So Paul writes, um, I'm interested in the training data sourcing policies of these companies as the potential users of these tools. We should be concerned about potential liability for things like unauthorized use of biometric information, other private data or IP in light of what's going on with Clearview AI. Uh, the sphere seems very relevant. So, um, you know, can, can the companies talk just a little bit about where you're sourcing the images from um, and what steps you're taking or what steps you hope to take to make sure that, uh, you know, copyright and 